Starting out as a beginner in the gym can be an extremely overwhelming and challenging process. Luckily for you today, we are going to answer numerous different frequently asked questions that can help you to succeed in the gym as a beginner. We're gonna talk about if you really need a lifting belt, the difference between Romanian deadlifts and normal deadlifts. We're even gonna talk about what supplements are the best for beginners. So stay tuned until the end of the video because we have all of that plus much more. If you're joining me for the first time, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. We help individuals of all abilities improve their overall health and knowledge of the gym and go ahead and give this video a like as it greatly helps to spread the message of inclusive fitness to individuals of all abilities. So what I wanted to start out with for the topic of this video is specifically along the lines of seeing results in fitness. So. A lot of times when people first start working out with me and they maybe haven't worked out in years, uh, maybe they just haven't worked out in literally ever. And they ask me, how long is it gonna take me until I can actually start seeing some results? How long is it gonna take for me to actually build some muscle and lose some weight and actually feel good? So let's dive into this exactly. now. Before we begin, I want to kind of uh, delineate the difference between having results and seeing results. Now, when it comes to having results, your strength gains you're going to get are actually going to be um, not too bad when it comes to the time it takes. So in about two to four weeks, if you are pushing yourself when it comes to your overall strength capacity, you will notice that you will get stronger, right? And it should be noted uh, when it comes to all these that we are talking about consistent. We are talking about consistent workouts. We're not talking about uh, just doing one workout um, literally once a week and then doing nothing. We're talking about at least two to three, maybe even four times a week of uh, specific strength type workouts. Of course, after doing that for about two to four weeks, you will start to notice uh, some good strength increases. Now, when it comes to muscle gain, unfortunately, on the other hand, this is gonna take a little bit longer. Usually people, when they're starting out and they're hitting the weights really hard, uh, it's gonna be about four to eight weeks, roughly, until you start seeing some um, muscle gain. And this is when we're talking about having results, right? So you might not actually see that on your body so far when it comes to strength, um, but you will actually have those results. You will be gaining a little bit of muscle and a little bit of muscle will go a long way. Uh, when it comes to fat loss, actually getting results when it comes to a fat loss sense comes pretty quickly. And even after just a week of being in a calorie deficit, you might actually be able to uh, kind of get some results and notice some stuff on the scale. Uh, when it comes to endurance training, so this would be something like maybe running or biking or something along those lines. This is going to come after about one to two weeks of endurance training. It's interesting and I think this is kind of anecdotal for myself. I can gain endurance, like I can gain running and aerobic capacity very, very quickly but I also lose it very, very quickly. Um, when it comes to strength, my strength is kind of always stagnant, uh, but my strength is also not as good as my endurance, so maybe that's just something for me personally. I don't know, it's hard to say. Um, but on the flip side, so let's dive in. You have these results, but when are you actually gonna see them? And I think seeing them and feeling them and feeling your strength and actually, um, seeing and feeling yourself be lighter whether you're looking in the mirror or uh, somebody notices you and says oh my gosh you know you've lost so much weight or you look so much stronger when are you actually gonna see results so the interesting thing about this is that you might never feel like you are losing weight you might never feel like you are actually gaining muscle and that's the hard thing about all of this is that as we just discussed, you will likely have results. You will likely get results, but you may never see them. You may never feel like you truly have them. And this is really because you see yourself every single day. So this is where I think it is so important to make sure you have a good tracking protocol that you are doing when you are measuring yourself. 
and this could be weighing yourself daily this could be uh, logging your weights at the gym so if you do like say a set of bench press and you're doing 100 pounds for example logging it and writing 100 pounds so then you know if the next time you're doing 105 pounds or 110 pounds you're going to be stronger um, you may not feel it and you may not even look stronger when you look at yourself in the mirror but you notice that hey I can now lift more than that. And that's a metric that you have 100% gotten stronger. Um, some other ways too that you can actually measure your body areas. Um, a DEXA scan, this is basically going to be a scan of your entire body and it's going to tell you where your water weight is held. It's gonna be telling you where your uh, bone mass is held. It's gonna tell you where your muscle mass is held and it's even gonna tell you where your fat mass is held in your entire body. So it's a really cool thing because um, you can literally see that, oh my gosh, I have so much more fat and not as much muscle in my left arm versus my right arm is way more muscular. And it can kind of show you some things about uh, maybe some imbalances in your body as well. I haven't personally gotten one of these done, but I would like to at some point in the future. Uh, and just know they're a little more expensive in addition to a bod pod. A bod pod is also uh, fairly expensive. Um, this will measure your body fat percentage as well. And it's basically something that you sit in and it kind of displaces the air around you. So uh, long story short, um, it can tell how big you are based off your weight, um, how much body fat you have. Um, look up bod pod online. It's basically this giant egg shaped thing and it can tell you your body fat percentage as well. Just talking about, of course, another way to track it. Uh, body fat calipers, those are little things that you can actually um, pinch on your skin and it can give you a rough estimate of your body fat percentage. Those aren't the most accurate, uh, but if you are really good with one of those, you can kind of do them consistently. So it can be a way for you to track overall uh, what your trend is, right? Um, and then of course, bioelectrical impedance analysis. Um, this is something where if you are standing on a scale or um, maybe you are holding um, uh, basically this thing, I can't even describe it right now, but it's basically like a giant game controller and you hold it and it has these pads, these electrical pads that send a shock through your body. And when it does that, it can trace how much water you have in your body versus how actual much uh, weight you have, which you put it on the scale. And from that, it can tell you a rough estimate of your body fat percentage. Those aren't too accurate as well because you can really uh, mess with what your body fat percentage is based off of um, how hydrated you are. So if you're really, really hydrated, it's gonna mess up that scale as well. Um, and then of course the good old tape measure. So you can take a tape and just measure your different body parts. Um, all of these are great ways to kind of measure and track progress when it comes to your overall body composition. Um, and feel free to go look online for more in-depth analysis and tools of these as well, uh, just to give you a a uh, little more perspective. Go ahead and like this video so far if it's given you some value and if you learned something new. Uh, but just remember at the end of the day, you will get results actually very, very quickly, but seeing results, that's gonna be the tricky thing and where uh, measuring yourself and keeping yourself accountable and maybe even asking people around you of like, hey, uh, do I look better? And hopefully they're um, not gonna lie to you and they're gonna be subjective. Uh, someone might lie to you. Have friends that'll tell you how you really look. Uh, it's an important thing in life. Okay, so the next topic we're gonna dive into is Romanian deadlifts versus normal deadlifts. Now, if you spent any time in the gym, you probably heard people talking about this deadlift and that deadlift and all sorts of things. And it can be extremely overwhelming, um, not only just because there's so many different exercises, but you're like, what's the difference? What's the point of doing one versus the other, right? Uh, I know when I first started, that's how I felt as well. So let's dive into this. So Romanian deadlifts, uh, basically the origin behind Romanian deadlifts is that there was this Romanian weightlifter, right? Shocker, um, good name for that. Uh, and he just wanted to find a different way to work his lower back and hamstrings versus just doing a normal deadlift. And we'll talk about what a normal deadlift is in a second. Um, the thing is too, he wanted it to be a way that allowed him to recover 
and um, just not hammer his central nervous system quite as hard. So this exercise he did, basically what it is, the bar or the weight will start in your hands, and you can technically do this with dumbbells too, um, but we're just gonna act like you have a barbell. So you start with the bar in your hands. The bar is not on the ground. You start with it in your hands, and then you will hinge at the hips, basically where you are lowering the weight down. So you're pushing your butt backwards, letting the weight go down all the way to your shins. You're not touching the bar to the ground, and then you will stand back up nice and tall. So essentially the bar is starting in your body, in your hands. You're not bringing it down to the ground, you're bringing it close to the ground and then coming up. So there's going to be a constant tension from the weight this entire time. You think about it, that weight after you do 10, 12, maybe even 15 of these, that weight is literally going to be in your hand for maybe, I don't know, a minute, maybe two minutes, depending on how many repetitions you're doing. And the Romanian deadlift is actually really great for building your pulling volume. So um, since you can't really overload this a whole lot, uh, you can't do a super heavy max weight because again, you're holding it for a really long time. This is going to force you to do less weight, which can build good volume to do many repetitions. Um, and those many repetitions can hopefully help to uh, build your overall lower back, hamstring, and um, glute strength for translating into a normal deadlift. Um, also, Romanian deadlifts too are a great option if you can't drop the weight or even lower the weight or put it down in a safe and controlled manner. Um, I used to work out at a gym at my, um, it was my college gym, and we couldn't actually drop weights or even put them down very, very uh, carefully because the floor was kind of messed up. So I did Romanian deadlifts a lot because that entire time I only basically had the weight on the ground one time when I picked it up and then when I put it down. Versus a normal deadlift, it's going to hit the ground, hit the ground, hit the ground numerous times. Um, also too, an RDL might be great if you have compromised mobility. Uh, since a normal deadlift, you need to literally bend all the way over or to pick it up off the ground when we're talking about the barbell or deadlift. You're going to need a lot more mobility in your ankles, knees, hips, um, lower back, hamstrings, etc to actually bend down and get that bar. So um, that's where um, if you are maybe an elderly individual, I work with a lot of seniors, so I will actually use RDLs pretty frequently um, to get them started. But of course, we would want to have them transition or move into a normal deadlift at some point. So when it comes to a normal deadlift, this exercise is so simple, um, basically describing it as the weight or the bar is going to be on the ground. You are going to reach down, grab the bar. You're going to stand that bar all the way up, just like we did in the Romanian deadlift, but this time you are going to lower the weight all the way back down to the ground. So it starts on the ground, comes up, and then ends on the ground. The Romanian deadlift, it starts in your hands, goes down to your shins, doesn't touch the ground, and then comes back up to your hands. So it's kind of that difference between constant tension. A normal deadlift is great for testing your overall uh, maximum strength or of course building your maximum strength because it starts on the ground. Um, you are actually going to be able to do a lot more weight overall uh, simply because it's basically one movement from the top versus holding that bar in your hands the entire time with a Romanian deadlift is going to really, really tax your body and become kind of a cardiovascular exercise at some point. Um, if you're trying to get better mobility too, is in the ability to get down and bend over, this is going to be a great exercise as well. When it comes to just programming these things, people will say, should I do this? Should I do that? Normal deadlift, Romanian deadlift, which one's better? I just need to know. Well, I would hate to say for you to fully just do one for the rest of your life. Ideally, you would do both in your routine. I do normal deadlifts typically when I'm trying to work my max strength, and then I usually do Romanian deadlifts as an accessory exercise or a secondary exercise uh, to actually build my overall deadlift strength long term. So that's kind of a way you can think about it and look at it. Um, so 
basically do both of them. Uh, if you do need some tutorials, I probably have some tutorials on my YouTube channel. Otherwise, you could just type in how to do a remaining deadlift, how to do a normal deadlift. Uh, I definitely have have a how-to on a regular deadlift and I believe we're mini deadlift on my channel. Can't remember, I should make a video on that though, that'd be a good uh, idea. Uh, go ahead and give this video a like so far if it's giving you some value. And we're going to take a peek into some fitness supplements that beginners might want to use on their fitness journey. So this is a kind of hot topic uh, when you're in the fitness realm because people um, are gonna try to sell you a lot of different stuff. And I am here to be an unbiased source of material that will hopefully guide you to um, maybe some good things that you can use, but also maybe some things that are kind of a waste of money. So to begin, do beginners really need supplements? No, absolutely not. Um, does really anyone need supplements? No, absolutely not. But um, you can get a little bit more bang for your buck at uh, sometimes in some specific uh, aspects of fitness if you do invest in some supplements. With that said, 95% of your gains will be made from proper nutrition, sleeping well, managing your stress, uh, managing your workload in the gym, and um, basically all of that stuff is not a supplement, right? Um, you're just basically having a good proper lifestyle. When it comes to supplements though, there are a few that are very highly researched and will give you a decent bang for your buck. Um, the first supplement that we're gonna talk about is creatine monohydrate. Now, creatine monohydrate is usually taken in a powder or pill form. Usually it's gonna be in a powder form because that is actually the cheapest version of this. And then what creatine monohydrate does is that it improves your muscular power, strength, and even size if you are able to use it to push yourself harder. And that's exactly what it does. One of the main mechanisms that creatine monohydrate works is that it brings water into the muscle. And when it does this, it can hydrate the muscle a lot better, which can actually help you to perform better, get more muscle power, get more strength, and of course, get more size over time. Also too, if we think about our energy systems, there is this uh, system in our body called the um, phosphogenic system and this is the system that is done when we need high amounts of force very very quickly so if you think about running across a parking lot because there's a madman chasing you or a car chasing you for whatever reason hope to god that's not happening to you uh, but just say you need to use a lot of energy really quickly the phosphogenic system is going to help produce creatine phosphate extremely quickly um, ATP, I should say, um, to actually get you to do that activity. And creatine, when you supplement it, can kind of help replenish that system a lot quicker so then you're able to do those high intensity activities. Um, creatine in itself is extremely cheap. Um, also, make sure you're getting creatine monohydrate. That's gonna be the one that's the most highly researched. That's gonna typically be the cheapest. Um, and it's going to usually have uh, just overall the best results there's creatine phosphate, I believe, uh, creatine diester, I believe as well. Monohydrate's usually the way to go. That's the one um, that I would normally get. I haven't used it in a while. Um, I've just kind of cycled off supplements, but um, yeah, creatine's super great. Just realize too, this effect on your overall muscle gain and strength gain is gonna be very small. It is gonna be there. It is going to be, um, especially if you're doing this consistently and taking that supplement consistently, it is going to uh, allow you to actually get some more strength results, but it's gonna be very, very small. It's not gonna be super, super huge by any means. So um, on top of that, caffeine is an extremely potent and efficient performance enhancer. Now, the way caffeine does this is that it actually helps to release calcium ions into the muscle cell. So when we're talking about how a muscle performs well, it needs a certain amount of electrolytes and different ions in its body to tell it to, hey, wake up and perform. And calcium is one of those things. 
Now, when you take caffeine, it can actually help to overall stimulate this release of calcium ions, so then your muscle is primed and more ready to go. If you think about it, this is actually why sometimes after you drink a cup of coffee or if you take in uh, just some caffeine in general, you might feel like, oh my gosh, I need to use the restroom. Well, that's because your digestive system is actually made of muscle as well. It's made of smooth muscle that you can't voluntarily contract. So when you're actually uh, taking in caffeine, it can kind of uh, force your guts basically to start working a little bit better too. I just think that's an interesting thing to note. Uh, something that um, I thought was interesting when I first uh, found out about it. Another way caffeine helps with uh, performance is that it decreases your perception of fatigue. Now in your body, there's these things called adenosine. Uh, the adenosine receptors and basically when you are awake throughout the day this adenosine builds up tremendously and when this adenosine builds up long term it's going to make you feel sleepy and when you sleep that adenosine is cleared out okay so adenosine helps you to feel tired what caffeine does it, it actually blocks the adenosine receptors from making you feel sleepy so that is a good thing on one aspect but the thing about this is that adenosine doesn't actually fully go away so you may be thinking oh it's like endless energy well that adenosine is still going to be there plus the adenosine that's going to uh, uh, accumulate and then ultimately fatigue you even more after that gym session so it will help you a little bit but you need to be careful because it's going to uh, build up and you're going to be even more tired, which might make you lean towards grabbing even more caffeine. Just kind of a double-edged sword and something for you to realize. The great thing about caffeine, um, it might be even cheaper than creatine monohydrate. Uh, so you can get this stuff in energy drinks. You can get it in coffee. There's tea. There's even caffeine pills. That's going to be the most straight and direct uh, way for you to get it. I personally like using coffee uh, just because I love the taste of coffee and uh, coffee in itself is extremely cheap and uh, can get you that good caffeine and also the caffeine from coffee um, aside from the caffeine can give you some benefits just from drinking the coffee as well that's kind of a, a uh, separate note um, but that's a good thing so caffeine feel free to uh, take some for improved performance. Also an interesting thing about caffeine, most of the studies done on this haven't been done in overall strength performance, although they can likely help in strength performance. Most of the research studies have been done in endurance performance. So basically time to fatigue, where they have people on a bike and ones who take caffeine are able to pedal longer and harder than the ones who didn't. So just another interesting thing when it comes to the overall caffeine studies. Uh, and then probably one of the other uh, best items that a uh, beginner can get when they're first starting out in the gym as a supplement is just some protein powder. Now, protein powder is simply being a convenient source of protein. And protein in itself helps to build muscles, helps to build tissues and repair tissues, and help with all the cellular functions in our body. So that's obviously a really good thing to have when you're trying to um, be a good and strong beginner in the gym as um, you're just starting out your fitness journey. But the thing about this is that it's no better than any other sources of protein. So it's basically the same as chicken, beef, eggs, and dairy. Um, it's just an extremely cheap and uh, portable and convenient source of protein. There's nothing magical about protein powder. Drinking it won't make you grow huge muscles or get uh, really, really strong really, really quickly. But if you are lacking in protein, it absolutely can help with that. Uh, I have in the description actually linked down in the product links um, one of my favorite protein powders that I'm currently using. Super, super cheap, really, really good uh, for yourself to use. And also just some notable supplements that uh, I don't use a lot, uh, but they do have some good efficacy and uh, can help you as well. Citrulline malate, this can help to improve muscle protein synthesis, which can overall help to build uh, more muscle cells and uh, help you recover more from your workouts. 
Beta alanine might help to increase endurance and endurance activities such as running, biking, swimming, etc. It might even improve your overall endurance in your workout sessions as well. So the ability to just have more stamina, have more, have more vigor overall when you are doing those workout sessions. Uh, fish oils, also pretty cheap. Uh, there is some decent evidence on heart health and even brain health and brain function overall. Uh, these are great if people are lacking in omega-3s and omega-6s. And then uh, there's this stuff called beetroot extract. This stuff is interesting. Uh, when you take this, a lot of people will note that they have greater performance. And this is usually because the circulation in their body is improved greatly. So if you take this, you might notice that your muscles feel full of blood uh, when you're doing your workouts. You just feel full of energy and uh, circulation and all that oxygen is just being taken and pushed right into your muscle cells. Um, and this is kind of one of the, the good things about it. Um, they have stuff that you can take, it's just literally beetroot extract and it tastes kind of dicey. They also have this stuff kind of put into a pill form as well, which you could consider taking. It might not taste uh, quite as bad, but um, yeah. So those are a few ideas for supplements. Go ahead and give this video a like if it's given you some value so far and um, helping you out on your fitness journey. Speaking about starting a fitness journey, a lot of times when people are first starting out, they ask me about lifting belts. And if you really, really need a lifting belt at all, um, and this is a uh, hot point of contingency because you see lifting belts literally everywhere in the gym. You see people using lifting belts when they're doing um, basically machine exercises. You see people doing it uh, when they're walking on treadmills uh, and you just see lifting belts everywhere. So I hope this gives some good context of if you really need one as a beginner or just an individual as well. So the way I want to set this up is by giving you an analogy. And that analogy is by imagining having a can of soda. And if you had an opened can of soda, how strong would that be? How strong would that can be against force being applied to it from all directions? That can is going to be incredibly weak, right? That can is going to be easily crushed by all the different forces around it, okay? That's an open can, that has very little pressure. Now an unopened can, there's a lot of pressure on the inside. There's a lot of that air pressure built up so that if you're pushing from the side and you're putting lots of different force on it, you will be able to, for the most part, withstand that crush. Um, of course, not if you're like literally stomping on it uh, or what have you, or if you're throwing it at your um, little brother who you despise, that's probably gonna crush it as well. But um, the can itself will withstand much more force than the unopened can, right? That's the end of the day. Lifting belts are kind of doing the same thing. Basically, when you put on a lifting belt around your stomach, this turns your body into kind of a more unopened can, quote unquote. So normally your body is basically um, trying to create spinal rigidity uh, through your core muscles when you are lifting anything heavy. So. Uh, when you put that lifting belt on, this actually allows you to create more intra-abdominal pressure. And when you create more pressure through your stomach and basically all the muscles surrounding your spine, you're gonna be more stable. And this increased spinal rigidity is going to allow you to perform better, you're going to be able to lift more, and there might be a little less chance of injury because you're able to brace your body and your core much, much better. So in a sense, you're kind of turning yourself into that unopened can of soda, where there's a lot of pressure built up around your core. Um, so do you really need one? Well, no, absolutely not. Um, and this is where I should kind of go into if you're a casual lifter versus an advanced lifter. If you are somebody who's just going to the gym to walk on the treadmill for uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes or run on the treadmill, just do some cardio. Maybe you're just doing some light machines, you're doing like a shoulder press machine or you're doing a leg press machine. Uh, you're just going in there kind of hammering through some of the machines. 
Um, if you're somebody who just goes in and just does some body weight exercises, you're just going through, through the flow. I would consider you a casual lifter. You will not really benefit from a lifting belt at all because the exercises you're doing don't really need a large amount of extra intra-abdominal pressure. Um, if you're an advanced lifter, however, if you're doing super heavy deadlifts, if you're doing super heavy squats, um, and maybe you want to at some point and someday, maybe you're not right now, uh, but if you do at some point, you might consider getting a lifting belt for yourself because this will kind of help you to brace better and uh, be able to allow you to lift more maximal weight in those compound exercises. Uh, basically, any exercise that challenges your core, um, keeping your core stable, like a squat, for example, or a deadlift, a lifting belt will help. Um, the cool thing about all this, though, is that you can still have and build intra-abdominal pressure in your overall stomach and body without a belt altogether. And this is simply done by taking a big breath of air through your belly before you lift and holding it. If you do that with a belt on, you're going to be able to build even more intra-abdominal pressure though. So that belt just helps to get a little more bang for your buck. Uh, but at the end of the day, you don't technically need one. It might be a good idea if you are considering being advanced at some day. Um, there's a lot of belts on the market too. I would highly recommend to make sure you get one that's an equal pressure. Um, all the way around your body so there's some where the back is tapered or basically where the lower back area is it's a lot higher and um, in the front it's a little bit skinnier i would get one that's an equal size all the way around because uh, that's going to give you equal strength distribution when you are pressing through uh, with your uh, core muscles to create that intra-abdominal pressure so hopefully that gave you a little insight into lifting belts and the the best uh, options for you and if you really need one like the video if that provided some value for you and of course we can't talk about lifting belts without looking at building a budget home gym so if you only have $500 and I picked $500 kind of arbitrarily because I think a lot of people might just have this uh, kind of extra and they're thinking how in the world am I gonna build a budget home gym I linked all the products down below um, that I'm going to talk about or you can check those out on Amazon but if I was building a budget home gym for $500 this is what I would do so we're gonna talk about the essentials and this is the essentials for me in my eyes so the first thing that I would get is a squat stand with a pull-up bar so a squat stand allows you to basically put weight on the bar and allows you to um, bring it out and of course do squats, do overhead press. And that addition of the pull-up bar allows you to do uh, pull-ups or various pull-up variations. You could do jumping pull-ups if you can't currently do a pull-up. You can do assisted pull-ups with a resistance band. Uh, I have a video on my channel on the difference between assisted and resistance band uh, pull-ups. You can check that out. Uh, but essentially, this uh, squat stand is only $162 and will allow you to do all types of exercises where you don't need to have the bar starting on the ground. And then of course, we do need a barbell on top of that to actually put in the squat stand, put in the squat rack, right? Uh, so the one on Amazon I found was only $59, $60. And all of this stuff, um, these, these first two things were from Cap. Uh, Cap is a very cheap and reputable source. Only $60 to get a basic chrome barbell. No, this isn't gonna be the best one. It's not gonna be able to uh, spin well on the bearings, but it, you are gonna be able to put some weight on it and get a good overall workout. And then I found on Amazon as well, they have cast iron plates that are going to allow you to weigh down the bar and give you some extra um, weight, of course, so you're not just lifting uh, for nothing um, with just that bar. So uh, a 45-pound pair, 25-pound pair, and a 10-pound pair, all those together uh, with the barbell and squat stand is going to rank in at about 513 total dollars. And that's not really that much if you think about it. Another thing I might add to if you have a little extra money, 
um, is maybe a pair of gymnastic rings. Those are just those plastic or wooden rings that you would put on your pull -up bar and those hang down. You can do ring rows with those. You can do ring dips. Uh, you can do ring row holds. You can do a lot of other exercises and variations with those gymnastic rings as well. Those are actually only 20 to $30. Um, you can find those on Amazon as well, but um, this is a really good place to start and would give you uh, some good ideas to help build that budget home gym. Um, just some other tips too for building a home gym that uh, I've kind of accrued from the years that I've uh, built my home gym is to leverage things like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or any online seller or retailer. And you can find seriously so many gold mines if you are just scouting out these sources every single day. Um, I got a large amount of my fitness equipment from Marketplace. I got a treadmill from Marketplace that was like $50. Um, I'm in the market right now to get one of those Schwinn Airdyne bikes um, that are kind of older. Those I can usually find for at least $50 to $100, super cheap. I found an adjustable weight bench that was about $250 on the uh, market normally if you bought it new for about $100. Uh, you can find so many things just like that if you scour the internet. Uh, there's also a lot of good secondhand stores that sell secondhand fitness equipment. Uh, we have one in my area called Play It Against Sports. Also, we have one called Treadmill Heroes. There's lots of these out there. You just kind of need to do some digging and see if there's some in your surrounding area where you can find some secondhand um, put down uh, fitness equipment. Uh, another thing that I didn't even think of but I wanted to add to is garage sales. If it's summer or if it's nice weather around uh, the place that you live, garage sales can seriously be one of the biggest gold mines for fitness equipment because a lot of times people uh, when they have their sales they're like you know what i don't want to haul this around i'm just going to put it out there see if anyone wants it and if it sells it sells it doesn't and you can also barter with these people too uh, because likely they're trying to get rid of it because it's going to be a little heavy it's going to be a little annoying to move um, but in addition to that of course asking people you know I got basically all of my bumper plates and weights from ex strength coaches I used to work with and they gave it to me uh, either for free or at an extremely discounted rate. Uh, so this is just from people I know. Um, also to um, there are some people uh, that I've had um, relationships currently with and I always ask them, I'm like, hey, are you trying to sell something? No, 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 not yet. Um, and then I'll just kind of put their bug in the air. I'm like, hey, if you're ever trying to sell any of your fitness equipment, let me know. I'll take some off your hands. Um, super good way to do it. The biggest thing too, just start out small. I started out by buying literally a barbell and weight set that was 300 pounds. That was all I had. I literally had just those things. And over the years, I've spent a little money here, a little money there, and I've slowly built up to much more than, uh, of course, that overall thing. But I only spent 300, well, it was a little bit uh, more than that with tax, but I only spent $300 to start my home gym. I only spent 300, I didn't have 500. But over time, I've saved up and was able to build even more up. Um, you can also get pretty creative at home too. Um, if you have a small box or even a set of stairs, you can do step ups, you can do assisted push ups, you can do some box jumps. Um, when I was uh, going through the pandemic, I actually used a cooler to load up weight and I did some rows with it. Uh, you could grab a sandbag or a backpack and just walk around uh, outside with those things. That's super heavy. Um, and you could just do so many different variations of workouts, but just be creative. I think that's the biggest thing. And also give the video a like if that gave you some good ideas on starting your budget home gym. Again, products linked down in the description if you did want to check those out. So another thing that people will talk about when they ask me about fitness and health is how in the world is my friend who eats the worst diet on the planet, skinny. I see them eating Twinkies. I see them eating pizza. I see them eating ice cream. I see them eating 
seemingly everything and they're as skinny as a rail. But I just look at a cupcake and I blow up instantly. How does that work? Well, here's the deal. There are some genetic tendencies that it comes to. These people that are naturally skinny usually tend to fidget and move a lot more. Okay, so this is what we call NEAT or non exercise activity thermogenesis. Basically, these people will kind of have little movements with their hands throughout the day. Maybe they'll tap their foot a lot throughout the day. Uh, maybe they'll pace a lot throughout the day. Maybe they'll just always feel the need to stand throughout the day. These people will usually have a lot of micro movements that they do unintentionally because their body just genetically how it is is telling them to consistently move and you may not think that this is a big deal but this amount of fidgeting literally can burn 500 sometimes to a thousand extra calories per day so if you're thinking about somebody who's eating unhealthy well if they're burning 500 to a thousand extra calories compared to you of course they're going to be skinnier than you because weight loss and weight maintenance is strictly that calorie balance. Also too, when it comes to genetic reasons that these people might uh, be skinnier um, after eating quote unquote everything, is that they have a lower appetite and they get full quicker. So the hormone that tells them to eat, it might not be triggered as much as yours. Also, the hormone that tells them to get full might be triggered earlier than yours. So if you think about it, they might be eating that ice cream and pizza, but they might be only eating a little bit of that. Or they might be eating that and then nothing else throughout the day because they're so full from just that one meal and they just don't feel like they need to eat anything else. So because of that, they're not consuming any more calories throughout the day, Plus on top of it, all that extra fidgeting that these people usually do is going to lead them to staying extremely skinny, of course. Uh, there is a slight metabolic difference as in these people, um, their, their metabolism is usually just burning more energy. They might be a little more hotter, uh, but all of those things usually come back to um, the neat. Their body is just telling them to move more, which can of course just burn more calories overall. The thing about this though that I want to reiterate too, is that you can still eat healthy and still gain weight. You yourself could be somebody who is doing your best eating only healthy, but you're still gaining weight or not losing weight. And this is because even if you're eating healthy, you can still overconsume on calories. You can still eat 3000 calories of broccoli. And if the amount of calories you need to maintain weight is 2500 calories, you're still gonna gain weight because you're still eating 500 more calories every single day. So it doesn't matter if it's junk food or healthy food, if you're overeating on calories or energy, you're going to gain weight, period. Bottom line, no questions asked. Of course, you're not gonna feel nearly as good if you are somebody who is um, basically eating a slightly more healthier version, right? You're, you're going to feel more garbage but when it comes to overall calorie balance and weight management, if you're in a calorie deficit, no matter what you eat, you will gain, uh, lose weight. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, and that's exactly what happens a lot of times with these skinnier people. They might be eating a small amount of crap throughout the day, but because they are in a deficit or maintenance with their overall weight and calories, they're gonna stick at the same weight. They're gonna be skinny. So um, just realize that these people are thin despite their diet. This is kind of the same parallel as somebody who lives to 100 years old and smokes every day. They didn't live to 100 because they smoked every day. They lived to 100 despite the fact that they smoked every day. And just the fact that they did it doesn't mean that it's gonna work for you. Uh, same exact thing when it comes to overall calorie intake and being lean. Um, so consider that for yourself and like the video if that gave you some good added value and ideas. All right, so last thing we're gonna dive into is uh, public gyms versus home gyms or commercial gyms 
and which one is better for your current goals. So if you have a current gym membership, you might be thinking, you know, I, I like going sometimes, but I really wanna start building a home gym. Should you do that or should you just stick with the gym, right? Should you just stick with the public gym and just forego getting a home gym? So let's kind of break this down between the two. So a public gym uh, will likely have a lot more equipment than a home gym if you're first starting out. Um, not likely, it will have much more equipment. The equipment is likely going to be of higher quality, so it might not break down as much, it might not be secondhand, it might be completely brand new. So you know that it's going to be the highest quality, it's not gonna creak, and it's gonna be very, very safe for you. Um, in addition to this, those regular gyms often have workout classes that people can do. So if you're somebody who really likes the socialization aspect and you like working out in a group or um, you just don't like thinking of a workout to do for yourself, public gyms, commercial gyms, usually have these opportunities for you to do exactly those things. On top of that, public gyms usually have, especially nowadays, some source of childcare. So if you um, want to, you know, dump your kid off for a little bit, uh, or if you're just watching your uh, sibling and you want to go work out, usually a lot of times these places have uh, childcare centers, so you can do that without even having to worry about your kid. I know a lot of times when parents are starting out, they think that uh, I don't have any time to work out because I need to watch my kid. Well, here's the thing: if you are able to you know put your kid off for a couple hours or even just an hour you're going to be able to get that uh, fitness in you're going to be able to reap those benefits and um, just stay fit right so child care is a huge reason i know personally at my current gym i go to there's actually a uh, playground like a giant playpen inside the gym that the child care center is based off of around of. so they literally are just playing the entire time in the child care center so they're getting a workout too uh not all gyms have this um you gotta search for ones but my local ymca does uh another great thing about it when it comes to a public gym is that there's a big change of scenery and this change of scenery can a lot of times be some good motivation for people because you get out of your home you start seeing other people you start feeling like yeah i'm part of a community uh, I'm able to kind of move and um, for me a lot of times it's just a good way to kind of re-spark my energy throughout the day. Just being around people, um, you know, this has got to have some biological tendencies uh, from how we evolved, but it just makes you feel better. Even if you're not directly talking to them, just being around people will likely make you feel more energetic, more motivated, and better to hit your workouts. And that chain of scenery is so necessary. Um, especially if you're somebody who works from home and does all those different things. On the flip side, the home gym isn't completely out of the race because the home gym is a huge time saver. So if you think about it, you can be like, oh, I'm just gonna uh, take my lunch break from work and then I'm gonna go crank out a 20 minute workout and then get back to work. You can do that and you don't have to spend any extra time getting ready, getting your water bottle ready, driving to the gym, walking into the gym, you literally just run downstairs or run into your home gym area, crank out that 20 minute workout. A 20 minute workout is literally 20 minutes versus doing a 20 minute workout at the gym might take 40 minutes, maybe an hour total because you gotta drive there. You gotta prepare to get to the car. You gotta walk in, you gotta scan your code. You gotta find a place to put uh, your, your barcode. You gotta use the restroom. All these things add up. Home gyms are a huge overall time saver. Another great thing about the home gyms is that you don't have to wait on any equipment at all. Now, of course, this is the double-edged sword. You might not have any equipment to wait on, but that's the thing where maybe you have a set of dumbbells and you have one other area where you're able to do a little bit of exercise, right? Uh, a couple exercises. This is still a form of equipment that you don't have to wait on. You don't have to worry about people taking your equipment if you are working out at your home gym. So that's something that I really like um, about having a home gym personally myself. Also too, you might be somebody who wants to buy a home gym because you want to be more cost effective over time. And if you think about it, that monthly gym membership, if it's $100 a month, uh, maybe it's even $50 a month, we'll just say 100 to make this easy. If you multiply that out by a year, that's 
$1,200. $1,200 you're spending on a gym membership. And there are a lot of benefits to that, but think if I took that $1,200 and put it towards equipment to start my home gym, you would literally never have to buy a membership ever again, ever again. Maybe you would because you like getting out of the house, but you uh, could be more cost effective over time. And also too, if you're moving different places, you're moving from city to city, that gym equipment could come with you, which is great because a lot of times when you're moving from city to city or apartment to apartment, you might not have a gym super close in your vicinity that you're able to get to right away. Uh, Another good reason you might stick to home gyms instead of uh, public gyms or commercial gyms is you're intimidated just of the gym atmosphere. You might not be fully comfortable working out in front of people. Maybe you just started your weight loss journey and you just want to kind of go in and go with the flow, right? You don't want to have to worry about all these people looking at you um, and you just feel judged before you even walk into the gym. Of course, if you go uh, and just work out at home, you don't have to worry about this. And this can usually build some good self-confidence in people to hopefully get them to not be intimidated the next time they go out in the gym because they've practiced some movements, they're able to get on a treadmill, you know, no problem. Uh, Maybe you can spend some time watching some videos. We have a lot of videos teaching you about um, how to get started at the gym on our channel. So you can check all those out as well. But uh, intimidation is a huge thing. Um, maybe you also just like working out alone. I personally enjoy working out alone as well as working out with people around me, but sometimes I just want to kind of zone out and have literally nobody around me at all. And that's of course a good reason that you might, uh, stick with a home gym. Um, you can of course set your environment right and have any music playing you want. Um, you can set up your equipment in the, the specific way if you have a certain exercise sequence you're doing and you don't have to worry about anyone coming in ruining that if you do have your home gym set up. Um, sometimes I'll set up my bench so I can do bench press and then set up a deadlift right next to it and then set up a core exercise right next to it. So I can just go boom, 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 boom. Even more of a time saver, if we talked about time savers earlier with the home gym, even more of a time saver by me doing that. And the thing about home gyms is that you can literally always build on it or downsize, right? So you can always get some more gym equipment. You can, of course, always sell it and maybe get a little less. Um, But I think just the fact that once you get that piece of equipment, that's an investment. That's like buying a car for yourself, right? That is yours. You don't have to worry about anyone taking it away. And over time, you can add more and more and more. And before you know it, over the years, you will have a super good home gym that has basically everything you could ever need for the rest of your life. God forbid we have another pandemic or shutdown uh, where you would actually be advantageous having that home gym. Um, So go ahead and give this video a like if that gave you some value. And consider subscribing to our channel as we help individuals of all abilities improve their overall fitness and knowledge of the gym, regardless of their current abilities in life. And if you also wanted to find out why you might be really hungry throughout the day and you just feel like you can't lose weight at all, we made another podcast talking about obesity and all the things related to genetics and why people are obese and um, why you might be struggling with obesity and weight loss. So go ahead and check out this video. I'm going to link it actually right here for you um, once this replay uploads. But until then, um, you can also just check it down in the pinned comment. I'll link it down there as well. Thanks so much for clicking on this video. We'll see you in the next one.